Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. As we move into the fall and with new silage going into the bunkers, we wanted to take a closer look at how best to meet the energy requirements of your cows. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here at the Real Science Exchange. Tonight, let's talk all about the dynamics impacting metabolism and feed efficiency. Uh, Dr. Paul Kononoff joined us for a very insightful webinar back on August 4th, 2021, titled Feeding the Metabolic Race Car, a discussion on the use of starch and fat as fuels. If you happen to have missed that webinar, you can watch it at valchem.com slash real science. Tonight, we're going to dig a bit deeper into feeding that metabolic race car, and then we'll uh, break down and discuss uh, various components of feed efficiency. Dr. Kononoff, welcome back to the Real Science Exchange once again. You were with us uh, a, a week ago, uh, and you're back now for your second trip. I, I trust you, you uh, enjoyed it. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back, Scott, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to this, this discussion today. Yep. So not only have you been to uh, two Real Science Exchanges, you also presented, as we discussed earlier, a webinar. We're also going to have you back once again for one uh, in a series of five podcasts that we're going to be launching to discuss the changes in the new dairy NRC. So, Paul, thank you for your willingness to uh, come here to the exchange with us and to share your time and knowledge with our audience. Uh, now, I understand you're our designated driver tonight, so you're not going to be drinking anything. But I also understand that there's a story behind your favorite whiskey, which is Jack Daniel's Rye. Looking forward to hearing the story. Well, I don't know if there, there's much of a, a story, but just maybe consistent uh, banter between uh, myself, Logan, and actually Dr. Weiss, who joined us uh, as well at one time. Um I'm not a big fan of uh, Jack Daniel's rye, but I do <laughs> like rye whiskey. And, you know, if you had to ask me my favorite one, uh, being a Canadian, I'd have to say Northern Harvest Rye by uh, Crown Royal. Probably trumps Jack Daniel's. Uh, nice. <laughs> I'll have to try that one. <laughs> yeah. So I see you brought a guest with you here tonight. Would you mind uh, introducing him? Yeah, this is really cool uh, to have this discussion today with Logan Mor Morris. Logan uh, uh, Logan joined us several years ago from The Ohio State University, he did his bachelor's and, and master's degree there. And it was just a blast uh, to have him here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, I, I referred to his dissertation several times in, in that last podcast that you mentioned. And it, it really kind of reads like a up-to-date manual on studying energy metabolism. Logan spent uh, his time here really uh, kicking back uh, some of the, the rudimentary traces of energy metabolism and how we measure it and, and what we know about it. And I think it's it's great to see his papers uh, now coming through the Journal of Dairy Science. In fact, I was just having a look at the October issue and uh, and uh, Logan's last paper actually shows up in the October issue of Journal of Dairy Science. Yeah, congratulations, Logan. Yeah, so Logan, uh, thank you thank for you. joining us here at the exchange. So tell us, what are you drinking tonight, number one? Then how's it been working with Paul? And then I uh, understand you finished up your research during COVID. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I appreciate you guys having he having me here on the podcast today, and appreciate Paul and inviting me along to be to be a part of this. Um, so, for my my drink today, I have a um, uh, Woodford Reserve Double Oak uh, via the recommendation of Paul. But to, to make it a little more interesting, I turned it into an old fashioned. So, um, very nice, really really good drink and and, and pretty good bourbon. So, uh, thanks for that recommendation, Paul. Um, so yeah, I, I finished up my PhD last uh, September, so it's getting pretty close to a year here. And uh, you're right, it was right in the middle of the the storm of COVID and all of that uh, that chaos. So um, you know, in, in hindsight, it ended up working out pretty well because I, I think I actually was able to get done a little bit early because of because of all that because we had a little bit more time to to dedicate to getting some of the writing done and, 
uh, none of us were traveling and I was able to kind of kind of work from home and really focus on getting getting the dissertation done and, and out there. So. Wow. Excellent. Dr. Clay Zimmerman, he's back once again as our co-host. Welcome back, Clay. And what are you drinking as if we don't know? And I, uh, I am back to my usual. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's getting towards the end of the season, but I have a watermelon hard cider here. All right. Evening. Let me ask you first, how long have you known Paul? Oh, quite quite a long time. I, so, so we have a mutual colleague, uh, Ryan Ordway. So mm -hmm. I think, I, so I, I think I met Paul initially through, through Ryan actually, cause they, yeah. uh, they were colleagues at Penn state at one time. And yeah, yeah if I recall correctly, uh, of course we've got a good strong Penn state connection. Uh, Ryan and mm -hmm. I were in the same office in, uh, in our graduate work. He was actually at that time working on his master's. But then he and I worked at uh, the University of New Hampshire together with Dr. Schwab. And I think, uh, yeah, obviously you had connections there too, didn't you, Clay? Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, what, when you were working with the Feed Analysis Consortium, mm -hmm. we, yeah, mm -hmm. we had some interactions then as well. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's been about 20 years now. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Clay, you asked me what I was drinking. Uh, due to the Ohio uh, connection, Logan, you didn't tell us your, your pedigree, yeah. but oh, I understand yeah, I you've got a couple degrees from uh, the Ohio State University. Um, yes, yes, I do. Yep. So I'm drinking a Balvini, which is my go-to drink when I'm with Dr. Uh, Palmquist. And I'm drinking it, as you can see, from my uh, Ohio State uh, whiskey glass. So <laughs> in honor of you there, Logan. Paul, during the webinar, uh, you went all the way back to studies from the 1960s. How has our understanding of energetics changed over the last 60 years? Yeah, yeah that's a, a good question. Um, you know, I would, you know, the, the interesting thing about energy is obviously cows need to follow the laws of thermodynamics. And so uh, those laws have not changed. Uh, but what has changed is, uh, well, we've, we've seen some rolling undulations on just interest in energy metabolism. Sometimes it's a it's a really hot area and sometimes it's 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 a lesser hot area uh so so just the focus of study has changed the animals have changed dramatically and hopefully uh actually I'll, we'll have logan weigh in on that a little bit but the the animals have changed uh and you know how we're viewing energy and and actually how we view energy when we supply it to the cows have changed feed characterization has changed dramatically uh, over, you know, the last, well, since the 60s, you know, and we'll be talking about that at the uh, uh, ADSA Discover Conference with the uh, NRC requirements of dairy cattle and how we measure it, how we look at it in our formulation software. There's been some big changes there. So, uh, you know, the, the question we can ask ourselves is uh, knowing the laws of thermodynamics and applying them to applied dairy nutrition studies, how do we go about actually measuring and studying energy utilization in applied dairy nutrition studies? And so, uh, you know, this may be a good time for me to ask Logan to jump in. You know, when you think about those fundamental studies that were conducted in the 60s and even some of the things we're doing now, how are we measuring energy intake and energy low from a, a technical standpoint yeah so it's interesting to look back on that that research that was done and you know several years ago well be, well before i was born uh, but it kind of laid the laid the foundation for the energy system that we utilize today it's like the nel system was developed back in the in the 50s and 60s um and you know from a from a technical standpoint the the equipment has changed quite a bit today versus what what was used several years ago so back in back then they would they would put a whole animal in a in a indirect calorimetry setup and try to measure uh, gas production and and, and uh, gas consumption uh, utilizing that system. And today, at least at the University of Nebraska, we were using head boxes to do that. So we would just put the cow's head in inside a, a system to to measure gas consumption and gas production. And you know, a much smaller system, much more economical, and 
and we think it's a little more friendly uh, uh, to the animals, allowing them to be in a little bit more natural state than separating them off and putting them in a in a large uh, contained system. So, so it's interesting Logan, how that, how that technology's adapted so much over the over the years. Logan, so let's maybe just take a step back when you think about uh, gas production and consumption. Uh, why is that mm -hmm. important when you're studying energy utilization? So yeah, yeah. where do so, those measures come into play? So we, we utilize those measures to, to calculate the amount of heat that a cow produces. Uh, and that's a, a pretty important component of the energy expenditure of a cow. Uh, if we look at you know total energy loss after uh, fecal energy excretion, heat production is, is usually number two. Um, so representing about a third of the, uh, a quarter to a third of the dietary energy that a cow consumes is is lost as heat. So do so do the cows they actually eat with and, and with their heads in those boxes, the diets in that box. Well, so one thing I will say is we've got a pretty nifty picture on uh, actually one of the one of the papers that will be posted describing maintenance energy in dairy cattle. So that that should be posted uh, on this webinar here. So there's there's a picture of the head box um, for those of us that were born uh, before 1990. We could say that that <laughs> probably looks like uh, a phone booth. And that's actually what the the animal care workers downstairs affectionately call this thing is is a phone booth. So the cows stick their heads in a phone booth. But uh, so Logan, how do we how do we get a cow in a phone booth? And uh, and uh, what are we doing? And what is she doing when she's in there? Yeah. So it's always a you know a little a little bit of work to get them in there the first time. They're not necessarily a little bit resistant to going in, but once you once you put them in there a couple of times and get them trained, they they start to go in there pretty pretty easily, and that's because they know their food's in there. When they so when they get into the head box, they can start start consuming that first meal. Um, so the boxes are essentially steel. the The whole bottom of it's steel, and that holds holds all of our feed for for the day. So it, you know, I, I would say when we operate those head boxes, that you know, one of the things I'm just struck with is just how miraculously adaptable these cows are that we work with you know whether we're talking about animals moving barns or pens on a farm to going from a commercial dairy to a research metabolism unit to our head uh, confined in that but logan's right if the if the uh, feed is there the water is there all of their comforts are there in fact this is a climate controlled barn and so we've had uh, producers in there saying well these are these cows are in paradise compared to you know what they could be facing in some of the conditions as far as uh you know environmental temperature conditions in the real world so when all of that's provided cows miraculously adapt really quite well and we see you know except you know pretty average uh, but but impressive levels of feed intake and milk production. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's pretty neat. Logan, uh, did I hear you say that you're capturing uh, gas production, and and if so, are you characterizing that? Yes, yeah. So we're specifically measuring oxygen consumption, um, CO two production, and methane production, and that's all a component of calculating the the heat production of a of a dairy cow. Quickly, Logan had mentioned research that was conducted before he was born. Yeah. And there was a famous uh, scientist with the last name of Brower. And, and what he's done is published yeah. uh, an equation that says, okay, if you know oxygen consumption, CO2 production, and methane production, uh, you can then calculate uh, uh, how much heat is produced. Uh, and uh, so it's a, a kind of a um, big equation that's used in the field of energetics all over the place. So you asked about methane. Uh, I won't take uh, Logan's uh, thunder. So, uh, yeah, how much methane do these critters actually produce? Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five hundred liters per day. And you know, we it, it depends on what they're eating and and how much they're eating. And the breed, obviously, we we work with uh, Jerseys primarily, and so their feed intake mm -hmm. to to get back to the variable that. That Logan mentioned their feed intakes lower, so their their uh, 
total volume of methane that's produced each day is a low is is a little lower so you you mentioned that quarter to a third of the energy consumed by the animal is is virtually wasted in in heat production what kind of factors uh influence heat production so we did a did a really interesting study where we looked at a bunch of different factors that that influence heat production we kind of found that the the two biggest ones and, and to no surprise are are dry matter intake and body weight that body weight component uh, represents the maintenance energy uh, expenditure, which is a, a necessary component of, of maintaining and, and keeping a cow alive and, and functioning. It's lost its heat, but it's still an, an, an essential uh, component. And then dry matter intake is the, the big factor that drives the rest of that heat production. And we can dig a little bit deeper down into that and try to understand how different nutrients and different, different um, milk components influence that as well. And, and kind of in general, you see that higher dietary protein leads to more uh, more heat production, and generating more milk protein leads to more heat production compared to compared to synthesizing milk fat. So, Logan, how does I, I'm curious how does how does stage of lactation impact what you see here? Yeah, from an energy yeah. standpoint, and 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 from a and from a feed substrate standpoint as well. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. We we tried to look into that a little bit, but uh, uh, one of the challenges is the data set that we had was all post peak uh, cows, so they uh, we didn't have any of the early lactation or peak peak lactation cows in the data set, which would have been really interesting to look at and see what's going on there, because you shift around where that energy is coming from, right? L mid and later lactation cows is coming from the diet, and early lactation cows a big proportion of that energy is coming coming from the back. Um, you would think that when they're mobilizing tissue, it would be more efficient than than consuming it from the diet as far as a heat production standpoint. So you would expect a little bit lower heat production in those cows than you would in the later later lactation cows that are consuming it from the diet. And that's just because putting milk fat or putting fat directly into milk is a, a highly efficient process. Whereas synthesizing some of those milk components isn't quite as efficient. So Logan, you know, related to, to nitrogen utilization and energy utilization, have you done some work looking at the cost of excreting this excess nitrogen that we feed the cow? So we looked at how, how urinary nitrogen excretion influences heat production and trying to get an understanding of the heat associated with that essentially excess nitrogen feeding that you're, you're kind of talking about here. Uh, and we know that as we increase urinary nitrogen, we're going to increase the heat production uh, of a lactating dairy cow. And and we there's been some um, debate kind of in the literature, what's the true cause of that? Some of it, the historical context says that it's because of urea synthesis generates quite a bit of heat. But there's you know some more recent arguments saying that that doesn't necessarily occur, but that extra heat is because of the catabolism of that excess protein. So the, converting that protein into other carbon skeletons and utilizing that within a dairy cow is a, a relatively inefficient process and leads to uh, some excess heat production, which can in, inherently influence the energy supply to a cow and, and influence energy balance in, in lactating dairy cows. So do you have an idea of how much, you know, how much energy that's costing? Yeah, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's relatively small. We're talking about maybe a maybe a mega cow or, or two mega cows per per day. So just a, a few pounds of milk. Um, but it, you know, every, every little bit of it adds up and, you know, it can be a little bit of difference in uh, affect the accuracy of trying to predict the, the energy value of different diets. It might be kind of neat to spend a little bit of time talking about look. Logan and I, we spent a little bit of time just poking around uh, maintenance requirements of dairy cattle when he was here. Yeah, yeah. Logan, are you game uh, to, t you, you measured maintenance at different, essentially different physiological stages, right? You want to talk a little bit about what you yeah, did in that yeah. study? I don't know. In my opinion, the most interesting project I did during my PhD work was to measure, try to reevaluate re the maintenance energy requirements and evaluate those on on Jersey cattle. Um, so we measured maintenance energy expenditure, both while cows were lactating and while they were dry and fasted. Um, kind of the backbone of the energy system is fasting heat production as an indicator of, of maintenance energy. 
And when you take a cow and fast her and get her to a complete fasting state, then she's just expending any energy to stay alive. And that's what really maintenance energy requirements are. The challenge with our lactating dairy cows is that it's, it's hard to get them to a fasted state. Any of us, we could, we could go off feed for, you know, six or eight hours and then we're, we're already fasting, but dairy cow has a huge room and it's continuing to supply energy to her once you remove feed. So we had to fast cows for um, 72 hours to get them to a full fasted state and then measure heat production uh, during that time. And we kind of kind of observed that uh, uh, heat production was not different between either, a, uh, sorry, maintenance energy wasn't different between either a fasted dry cow or, or a lactating cow. Um, so suggesting that those, those are relatively similar, but we did see that maintenance energy requirements are likely a little bit higher than they were in, in those historic studies we were talking about from the 1950s and 60s and, and kind of what's used as the, the current backbone of the, the NRC system. So, so why do you think that the, those maintenance requirements might be higher now? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that, that can play into that. Um, you know, we, we've selected cows for higher production, high, higher dry matter intake, and we've, we've created a cow that has more metabolically active uh, tissue per unit of body weight. We also have cows that are a little bit leaner today too. So I think per unit of body weight, they have more, more metabolic activity just, just as a whole leading to a higher, higher maintenance energy requirement. So one of the cool things, Logan, you've talked about it pretty quickly, but you know, this whole notion of fasting cows for 72 hours, like yeah, when I think yeah. back, you know, you coming into my office and saying, Hey, I think we should do this. I mean, I think we all had a little bit of angst around not feeding cows. Um, of course, people go fasting for long periods of time, whether it's voluntarily uh, or, you know, pre-surgery or anything, but so like, yeah, we had these cows down here and they were fasting. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about like just what we saw? Like, did they go bananas or, you know, were they healthy or what were our observations there? That's yeah. one thing that's obviously not in the paper, but I think it's interesting to talk about. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I, when we, when we went into this, I thought it was going to kind of be a bit of a train wreck, right? You move, remove cows from feed for four days and don't necessarily expect that to go well, but Surprisingly, it went went relatively well. Um, cows seemed to handle it okay. They might have been a touch restless and a little, you know, uh, maybe a touch more nervous, but overall they handled handled it pretty well. Um, kind of one of the interesting things was that the cows definitely seemed uh, cooler. So you, you you could kind of see the hair standing up on the back of their on their backs because they weren't producing nearly as much heat as they they, they were before. So their heat production was probably a third of what it was when they were actually lactating. I was curious, you know, so they, do they become ketotic there, then and how fast does it, does that occur? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they're certainly ketotic because they're just mobilizing body tissue to, to meet their energy requirements. I, you know, we didn't necessarily measure any, any indicators of that, but I don't know that they would be as ketotic as say an early lactation cow or yeah. because they're not mobilizing or don't have nearly as much energy demand. Uh, as that as that cow, so that would be interesting to look at a little and further. These cows were not when we did the fasting heat production; they were not uh, lactating. So, okay. uh, yeah, so their demands were just basically the normal physiological demands on you know yeah. staying alive. So, Paul, I, I don't think I've ever asked you when I came into your office with this uh, crazy idea of fasting cows for. 72 hours. What did you really think about that idea? And yeah. to be honest, I kind of expect you to shoot me down pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, of course, it's always fun uh, to hear, you know, interesting ideas with good uh, rationalization behind them. But I, you know, obviously I had read some of the estimates in the literature um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I knew it had been you know, a while since, well, I know it had never been done with, with Jersey cows. And I was really game just to, you know, conduct that study and see what we could learn with that breed. And uh, of course it was, what, as you know, I'm a kind of a historical junkie. And so to have that opportunity to, to compare some of our data to some historical measures, uh, Logan, I think you remember you dug out the paper 
of uh, Jim Holter from the University of New Hampshire that conducted a pretty similar study with with Holsteins. And so, yeah, to me, it was it was really fascinating to see how our data would compare against some of those studies. Logan, you mentioned that in, in one of your comments back to Clay, something about tissue energy. How do we measure tissue energy? Within our energy scheme, we are able to measure all the other energy uh, expenditures of a cow and all the other energy excretions. So we know much, how much goes into the cow, how much is lost in feces, how much is lost in urine, how much is lost as gas energy, and how much she puts into milk. And then tissue energy is, is essentially what's left over. So we're not technically measuring it within these studies, but being able to calculate it by difference. And, and we're able to do that by applying the first law of thermodynamics and knowing that energy is not created uh, uh, nor destroyed. So we have to have to or know that all of that leftover energy would, would is assumed to be tissue energy. So that's where my mind kept going. Shouldn't we really be focused on 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 how efficiently are we turning these things into animal protein? And I, I know that our our, our fellow poultry uh, producers and swine producers that's a key metric that they're 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 looking at. And so it was uh, uncomfortable. Uh, uh, uncomfortable for me to think in the, the, the just taking a look at the energy aspect of it just was kind of curious what yeah what your thoughts were there and the thing is and i i mean not to give you a, an academic argument but it if we look at uh efficiencies as expressing it as inputs and outputs the dairy cow is just so complicated yeah. right there's yeah. there's yeah. different yeah. inputs and different utilization and uh yeah, that's it. That's a challenge. It, it really is when we look at dairy production. Yeah, I keep thinking, well, we could, you know, do a whole herd basis. But even then, you do that, you don't know where to improve and what, what mm -hmm. tweaks to make. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just, mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I think kind of the, a lot of the basis of our work was thinking about looking beyond feed efficiency and looking at energy efficiency rather mm -hmm. than, than feed efficiency. Because mm -hmm. I think it's from an, uh, from an academic standpoint, it's a little more telling as far as what's going on it's a cow mobilizing that tissue energy to, to 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 produce milk right and creating a misleading feed efficiency logan i'm curious um were you surprised at all in the you know in, in the starch versus fat study with the higher fat diet that you weren't getting some fat accretion there or that you had mm. le less fat accretion or yeah. not uh, not necessarily um I think, well, one of its because one one thing is that there's a difference in the energy supply in those actual diets when we measure it. So I don't think it's necessarily surprising that the starch drove more energy. And then, you know, fat accretion is partially an insulin-driven response. So um, increasing starch and driving insulin would signal for an increase in fat accumulation. Right. Yeah. Right. Clay, you you were asking about how differences would have been in the state by stage of lactation. Just a little bit of you may find this interesting. So, as you can imagine, it's really hard to find research funding uh, to do something yeah. like that, yeah. like feed you know sources of energy, corn. We're going to manipulate starch, right? And so that was one of those studies that actually was kind of funded out of just some residual funds that that I had from different different opportunities that we had along the way it turned out to be a, a really cool simple study only two treatments and so you can yeah. make that that comparison uh but the, the the animals were in that you know late stage of lactation which of course make up a a, a big component of any dairy farm but yeah the question would be really interesting to to see is okay well what would that look like in early lactation yeah so Logan, I, I'm, you know, I'm curious you, now that now that you've been out in the industry for a year now. What what kind of learnings can you take from your work that you've that that you've been able to apply now in the uh, in your career? Yeah, one of the first things I think about. I was thinking about this beforehand. We didn't didn't delve into it during the podcast, but one of the the interesting thing is 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 the world that we live in today has changed quite a bit than than what it was four or five years ago. And from a milk production standpoint, we, we see that there's a lot of producers out there that are facing uh, production caps and having to deal with these different quota yeah. type of systems. Uh, and from my research work, we did some work at, at, like that starch and, and fat study showed that higher starch increases milk yield. Well, if you have a production cap, you want to 
produce as concentrated you want to produce the lowest milk volume you can with the mo- the maximum components so the, the, the that study to the field and you uh w- would suggest to feed a little bit lower dietary starch to, to try to prevent an increase in milk yield and in, in, in cows without giving up milk protein mm-hmm. without yeah right. with, without giving it up trying not to yeah yeah right right so you want to produce five pounds less milk but get an extra tenth or two tenths of of milk protein and, and we're and still seeing that off around the country i don't know if you guys are too so logan he's been out in the real world for uh a year now right logan and uh yeah, yeah. i know you know one of the things that you're doing is you're spending a lot of time with these uh different uh nutrition models whether they're the commercial ones or even the nrc 2001 and you'll be working for the next one but you know if you have to think about energy metabolism um and actually quantifying energy use and uh, requirements for lactating cows in some of these models, where do you think we could make some inroads uh, to uh, improve them even even better than they are today? We know that there's some areas that the, the science has shifted a little bit on as far as energy metabolism and some opportunities to update those those energy models. Pretty much all of the energy models in the field, at least from a digestive or post-absorptive metabolism on utilize the NRC 2001 system. There's a little bit of a few differences between uh, uh, in, in the C and CPS system, a few tweaks to that, but in general, it's, it's, it's fairly similar. And the, the NRC assumes that the conversion of ME or sorry, DE to ME is essentially a constant uh, and doesn't vary much with diets, but we know that's not really true. We know that as we increase crude protein, we're going to increase urinary energy loss. Uh, and that's not necessarily accounted for in, in those models. So we did some work um, with uh, Paul and I and some collaboration with uh, some professors at Ohio State trying to look at how uh, urine, increasing urinary nitrogen influences urinary energy excretion, trying, trying to create a tool that can be used to model, model that and be able to predict it from different diets. And then as far as the the Net, net energy side, we, as we were talking a little bit earlier, we know that maintenance energy has changed. So there's some, some opportunity, opportunity to update that as well. But we also have to look at how uh, the, how efficiently a cow converts her metabolizable energy into net energy when we're considering those things as well. Uh, another aspect of that maintenance energy work is that we, we've shown that cows today are a little bit more energy efficient than they were, than they likely were uh, several years ago. So in one of your studies, you found that, uh, that the NEL values, um, I think this, this was, this was when you were comparing the high starch diet from corn versus yeah, the high yeah. fat and your NEL values were, were quite a bit higher than what NRC predicted. Why, why is that? Yeah, well, that, that was really an interesting finding from that study. And that's kind of, was the first study I did during my PhD and kind of kicked off the rest of these studies that we've been, we, we we've been talking about. Uh, there's a number of factors that played into that. Um, the diets were a little bit more digestible than the, the NRC said, so the DE was a little bit higher. Um, and then the conversion of DE into ME was was greater in our, in our observations than what the model said they would be. Uh, some of that's because we were feeding a lower crude protein diet and the urinary energy excretion was a little bit lower. Um, so those cows were a little bit more efficient there. And then the biggest difference was the efficiency of converting uh, metabolizable energy into net energy. Um, NRC uses like a 64% efficiency and these cows were approaching 70% overall efficiency. So that, that led to the higher overall NEL diet, NEL values on those diets than, than what was picked up in the, in the model. So how does, how does all this tie back to feed efficiency? We hear a lot about feed efficiency now, you know, becoming, you know, uh, Certainly, if we can if we can improve feed efficiency, that that can have a big economic uh, improvement for the dairy. So, how does all this work tie back to feed efficiency? Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's an interesting and important uh, uh, applicable question. Um, so, as far as the uh, change in maintenance energy requirements, because those are a little bit greater today, I think it further emphasizes the importance in, in feeding for maximizing production to, to further dilute out those maintenance energy requirements and maximize uh, 
our, our feed efficiency that way. Um, the, the values we observed were about 20% greater, right? So putting, putting even more emphasis on uh, uh, feeding for, for maximizing production to, to dilute that efficiency. You know, the other thing about feed efficiency, I mean, I, I understand the, the value of studying that mm -hmm. and tracking it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the, the dairy cow is pretty unique or pretty special, especially when you compare to, you know, a group of feedlot steers or, or feeder pigs that are all at the same physiological stage. Uh, you know, there's, you have cows at different stages of lactation and low, we talked a little bit about tissue energy. Mobilization of tissue energy has a dramatic effect on feed efficiency. The most efficient cows you have in your herd are the ones that are losing weight. Well, so right. that's not necessarily saying that your ration is doing a good thing. What that shows you is some of the limitations on on relying on on feed efficiency as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up the discussion. I think uh, feed efficiency can be extremely uh, valuable and uh, a, a useful proxy, uh, as to use a term that some of my graduate students have used, but uh, just an estimate. Uh, just on that note, I used proxy. I threw it in there because I had a graduate student that used proxy a lot, and I I didn't like the term. It just wasn't descriptive enough. But uh, <laughs> if I use it as a proxy or an index of uh, feed efficiency, um, it can be misleading. Uh, certainly, uh, you you need to understand when you measure it, you know, what are the conditions around it? Are they very similar to the same conditions the last time you measured it? Right. So to kind of echo what Paul was saying, it's easy to measure feed efficiency right in the field. And maybe it has some drivers from an economic standpoint, but overall we probably should be looking at energy efficiency of these diets to get a, a better indicator of what, uh, the, what kind of things are going on from a metabolic standpoint. So you talk, you talked earlier, you know, one of the gases that you're measuring is methane. And, you know, you talked about the four to 500 liters per day of methane that mm -hmm. was being, being mm -hmm. produced by these cows. So, so how, how much of, how much of an energy sink is that as a proportion? In the grand scheme of things, it's relatively small. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about five, 6% of, of gross energy intake. Does that sound about right, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. So it's relatively small, but it isn't, it, it matters at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So if you were able to reduce enteric methane production, say by 50%, how, how, how much milk yeah. would that be worth? Yeah. So if you could spare, you know, a few mega cows of, of, of energy and lead to a couple extra mega cows of NEL, you can, you know, that'd be four or five, six pounds of milk. Um, but I think the big challenge is, can you can you actually do that? Um, because we know that methane energy is positively correlated with di digestibility. So th there's some different strategies out there that may decrease methane, but they also decrease the, the digestible energy of the diets and you might have a net wash there. There's also more more work being done on, on feed additives that can inhibit methane production in the rumen, but that hydrogen that's produced in the rumen has to go somewhere and, and we see that hydrogen gas production increases, which in a normal situation, gas energy is 99% methane. So we don't necessarily care about the other energies uh, or other gases that contain energy. But when we inhibit methane, increase hydrogen production in the rumen, and, and that the cows blow that off in, in the gas fraction, we're shifting that proportion around. So there's a lot of hydrogen energy loss too, that we must we have to consider when we're actually calculating uh, gas energy and, and metabolizable energy supply. Okay. So, Paul, I, this question came up during your lecture, but I, I'm curious to to revisit the the question about Jerseys versus Holsteins. So, yeah. so how applicable is is the Jersey research to Holsteins? Yeah. Well, so I think uh, I, I've shared some of my thoughts in the last podcast. I'm going to maybe. Uh, defer this uh, to Logan, and let's let's hear Logan's take on this. Yeah, yeah. So when we when we look at the data, we we know certainly or know there's differences between the jerseys and Holsteins as far as, as size and, and component production. Uh, 
But if we start to correct for those things and we look at these energy data uh, relative to body weight or relative to, to like energy corrected milk production, we don't necessarily see a lot of differences between either a, a Jersey data set or a Holstein data set. Um, so as far as we, we can tell these, these data that we're collecting on jerseys should be applicable to Holsteins. But I guess the real answer is we don't know without necessarily comparing the, the two of them together. So Logan, uh, maybe just talk a little bit about your your observations on maintenance on jerseys. And yeah, maybe, yeah. you know, what yeah, you observe yeah. compared to there there have been some recent estimates of maintenance of, of other breeds too. So maybe just uh, yeah, compare yeah. and contrast some of those things. Are they are they do they have lower maintenance? Yeah, so there's some some maintenance estimates out of on on some Holsteins out of Europe, uh, done about 20 years ago or so, and they were they were relatively similar to the measurements that we picked up. Um, so which again would suggest that they're relatively similar in their their energy requirements and and, and energy metabolism. I think the 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 biggest opportunity where there may be a little bit of differences is if we have differences in the milk fat to protein ratio. So if we have have Jersey cattle that are producing quite a bit more milk fat relative to that protein versus a Holstein. So, so pushing that fat to protein ratio up towards one and a half, they may be a little bit more energy efficient because we know that milk fat synthesis is more energy efficient than milk protein synthesis, or more specifically converting dietary fatty acids into milk fat is, is a relatively high energy efficiency uh, uh, process. So, so looking at it on an energy corrected milk basis there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are a little more efficient. So when we, we look we at it, they, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Logan. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go you ahead. go ahead. Uh, I think we, we think they may be if they have a little bit higher milk fat to protein ratio. Um, but in typical production situations, we don't necessarily see any differences there. Okay. And certainly if you look at it as per unit of metabolic body weight, they're similar. You know, um, we didn't study this, but uh, I know there's a lot of interest in the field uh, looking at crossbred with uh, Norwegian Red, Montbelliard, some of these other breeds. I'm not a geneticist, but it, it looks like the structure has developed very similarly, the body structure and body condition in Holsteins and jerseys as far as composition. Obviously some differences, different breeds, but there's some similarities. Whereas when you look at like these Montbelliard, uh, crosses with Norwegian red and Holsteins, there's some pretty, I think, dramatic differences in uh, body condition score, wouldn't you say, Logan? And so, you know, if, if you look at actually, you know, uh, body condition score is, we, we express uh, maintenance as per unit of metabolic body weight. But all of a sudden now, if you've got some of these breeds that are carrying a little more condition, a little more fat, maybe there's some some differences there because of the, the type of body condition that, that they're actually carrying around. Yeah, we, that kind of goes back to, we always have to remember that the most of the, at least the maintenance energy expenditure is from primarily from lean tissue. So if they have a greater mm -hmm. proportion of lean tissue mass, they're gonna have a higher maintenance energy expenditure. Your topic of your webinar was, you know, using carbohydrate and fats. How do you see those uh, differently and how does a cow utilize those differently? And is there a preference one over the other? Does it depend on stage lactation? Can you expound on some of those? So I'll actually have Logan uh, come in behind me on this. I mean, that really was the focus of the first study that you conducted here is tracking energy flow when it came from yeah. good old Nebraska corn. Sure versus <laughs> maybe uh, some rumen yeah, bypass yeah. sources. So do you wanna maybe touch on the, the highlights that you observed in that study and, and how those may actually differ? So we saw that when we fed, uh, fed diets that were formulated to have the same energy, uh, but with more starch in them compared to, compared to fat as an energy source, we increased milk production and increased milk protein yield uh, via that avenue. We think a lot of that was to do due to the the differences in how those energy sources are utilized within the within the cows. So the starch can provide energy to the rumen and be utilized for microbial protein synthesis and supply some amino acids to the cow that way and allow it to drive uh, uh, milk protein yield. Also, the starch can supply 
glucose directly to the cow and, and, and potentially drive an insulin signaling response uh, indicating or, or, or upregulating milk protein synthesis uh, uh, that way. It's also, also interesting to note, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, that the higher starch diet actually had a little bit more energy in it when we measured it than the, than the higher fat diet. So it may just simply have been an energy response. So increasing energy supply drove milk protein by uh, just just increasing the overall energy substrates. So how how was the uh, how was the corn grain processed in that study? Yeah, so this was just uh, just fine ground corn from our from our feed mill that we use used to supply uh, feed at at the university. Uh, it certainly, yeah, the differences in processing could certainly have a huge effect on how these uh, could influence the response here. So if we would go to a more highly processed or more available starch source, like a, a steam flaked or a high moisture corn, that would just be primarily supplying more rumen energy uh, and potentially influence microbial protein that way. But if you go to a little bit less ground corn, you're going to supply more more glucose to the animal by getting some of that starch through the rumen and, and into the intestine and, and potentially driving a, a more of an insulin response. But then how does that influence the overall energy supply, right? If that's not quite as digestible as the, the other sources of starch. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of avenues there that, that, that certainly need to be further explored is looking at how energy sources and, and feed sources influence uh, milk production. So I'm going to ask you to speculate on this one. We talked about stage of lactation a little bit earlier. If you yeah, had run yeah. this study in early lactation cows, do you think you would have had the same outcome? That's a good question. I have some I, thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you would so, have. I don't know about mm, the I don't know about yeah. the starch versus fat question. Uh, we yeah, we. Yeah. Uh, we did some work. We this is uh, 25 years ago <laughs> in my career. <laughs> we did we did quite a bit of research. First of all, with early lactation cows, these would be cows like 30 to 110 days in milk, let's say. Mm -hmm. So cows around peak. And then we'd also run what we'd call mid lactation trials. These would be cows like 120 to 200 days in milk. And we did some work looking at, at corn processing, actually. Mm -hmm. The early lactation cows, uh, we, could, we could bump up peak milk. So if there's more energy available to the cow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, uh, she'll put that into the bulk tank, basically. Because the cows in your study on the, on the high starch diet, they, they, they were creating fat, right? Yeah, yeah. When you do that in mid-lactation, so we, we actually sort of repeated some of these studies uh, or similar studies, early lactation versus mid. In mid-lactation, of course, their lactation curve had already been set at that point. Mm -hmm. What we observed in those studies mm -hmm. with increased uh, grain processing, uh, we didn't get a milk response. The cows actually reduced dry matter intake a little bit. Yeah. So you improve mm -hmm. feed efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. in that case mm -hmm. but um yeah mm -hmm. I, I don't i don't know how the you know how the fat piece would have fit into that but mm -hmm. uh we had seen some of that from a starch standpoint mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. just yeah. just curious yeah. your your take on that yeah yeah it's an it's an interesting interesting response an interesting idea it's you know kind of supports the idea that the early lactation cows are, are relatively nutrient deficient. So if we increase energy or, or other nutrients, we generally see it in, in the in milk uh, milk production in, in the bulk tank. And I think you could see the same thing when we increase fat in those early lactation cow diets, at least as, as long as it's a fat that's not influenced in the rumen environment, uh, you know, some of what the recent research would, would suggest. Whereas in the later lactation cows, if you, if you modulate energy supply, it, it usually is reflected in tissue energy. So um, you increase starch, increase energy that way. We see, see changes in body weight gain or, uh, you know, increase, increasing fat. You, you may see, may not necessarily see that in the bulk tank, but might see it on the, uh, you know, on the cows. Right. So, you know, there's uh, one of the things, this is maybe switching gears a little bit, but there's a lot of interest, whether it's in the industry or research and 
looking at uh, amino acid requirements per unit mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. energy. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's an intriguing concept. Uh, I don't know. What do you folks think of that concept in, as far as setting uh, requirements? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, since I've left the academia world and started working out in the, in the, in the industry, we, you know, sh shift over from the NRC model to the, to, to the CNCPS side of things. And that's kind of where they're, they're at as far as looking at those amino acid requirements. Um, you know, it kind of makes sense to include energy in that, in that scheme because we know that milk protein synthesis is, a, is an energy dependent process. Um, but there's some, some interesting challenges that, that kind of come to mind, as it, at least as it relates to a lot of the work that we did. We know when you're looking at grams of amino acids per megacal of ME, there's no designation on what that ME actually is. So our research mm -hmm. shows that starch and fat act uh, quite differently as far as uh, influencing milk protein production. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, what those energy sources are have a big influence on how you should be looking at these these amino acid requirements. I'll see diets in the field that'll be be really high in fat and they'll have a lot of ME in the diet because of that. Well, then that would suggest that you need to feed more amino acids uh, to meet the amino acid requirements of those cows. But I don't necessarily agree with that or you don't necessarily see that in, in production responses because that milk fat is not necessarily supporting milk protein uh, synthesis. Mm -hmm. And what about in group feeding? How how trend, how uh, how useful is it to be looking at amino acids per unit of energy? Do you have any thoughts there? <laughs> to me, that's where <laughs> that's where there's a yeah. lot of questions because you've got some animals gaining yeah, yeah. energy and some yeah. losing energy, and and um, where I where I think I think it just gets more complicated. So I yeah yeah. You know, I, would, I think I think I would, my experience in the field would say I, I think the concept is correct. I think mm -hmm. I think in general we see more consistent responses to amino acid feeding in the field, looking at at the uh, you know grams of metabolizable amino acid per megacal of me, rather than just mm -hmm. feeding you know targeting gram amounts of amino acids. Mm -hmm. But Logan brought mm -hmm. up a really mm -hmm. good point. Where, where is that energy coming from? And, and mm -hmm. that yeah. certainly yeah. makes a difference here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. And, and on that same topic, I would kind of add that, you know, one of the biggest benefits I see of looking at grams of amino acid per megacal of ME is that it allows for a standardization of those diets, essentially. You're essentially standardizing them to dry matter intake. Mm -hmm. And that removes this whole grams of amino acid thing uh, that, that differs, you know, if we're talking about a thousand pound Jersey producing 60 pounds of milk or a Holstein cow producing a hundred, 120 pounds of milk, right. They're going to have very different yeah. grams of amino acid requirements, but you can look at mm -hmm. the grams for mega cow of ME and they'll be relatively similar. or should be very similar between those two, two different situations. Mm -hmm. So allow them to be more, a little more consistent in recommendations that you're making for supplementing and, and looking at dietary amino acid levels. So, so Paul, that, that whole amino acid discussion, uh, it brings me to the second study that, that you were talking about during, during the real science lecture, looking at, at supplementing lysine yeah. in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in one of these studies. I'm curious in that, in that study, um, were there other amino acids that were limiting in that study? Mm. Or, or what would the next limiting amino acids have been, in your opinion, beyond lysine? So Logan went through all the exercises on uh, formulating those diets. Uh -huh. And I would say in general, you know, the aim was to make sure nothing was was deficient. But uh, and I know we're really going to draw on his memory in, in formulations, <laughs> but Logan, when you think yeah. about other amino acids, whether whether they were or weren't limiting in those diets, like can you think of maybe the the next generation of amino acids we should be looking at? And, yeah. You know, what are your thoughts yeah. there? We spent all this time focusing on lysine and methionine for you know the last twenty years or so, and I think it's really start time to start thinking a little bit beyond just those those two amino acids. Um, in those particular experiment, right, we were testing just lysine, but we did supplement methionine to make sure that wasn't deficient. 
um, but they were relatively lower crude protein diets. So then a histidine deficiency comes right to the forefront. We, we know that lower crude protein diets generally can be, can be deficient in histidine. And then there's kind of a, a, an evolving and growing body of evidence supporting other amino acids to, to stimulate milk protein production or amino acids that we would call stimulatory amino acids, uh, which would be like leucine and isoleucine, which uh, signal and, and, and activate mTOR to potentially drive an increase in milk protein production. So there, there's a number of amino acids that could, could potentially be limiting or in the in that particular experiment or that if we would add them to the diets we could could potentially see a response to those amino acids as we close it up then uh, i'd like to have uh, each of you kind of give us you know one or two perhaps three recommendations that uh, nutritionists farmers can take home in terms of improving the the energy efficiency on the dairy farm well i think kind of the, the one of the biggest takeaways from my standpoint and we spent a lot of time discussing it today is the differences in energy sources and, and making sure we're, we're looking at those and, and evaluating those properly so we know that starch and fatty acids behave a little bit differently in the cow uh, from an energy standpoint and energy efficiency standpoint so making sure we're looking at those, those appropriately looking at starch as a as a relatively robust energy source to supply energy both to the rumen and post uh, post metabolism, whereas fat is an energy dense source and can supply energy to to support milk fat production in in dairy cows. Clay, well, first of all, I want to commend Paul and and Logan for really you know doing Thank this you. type of research, looking really looking deeper at uh, at energy utilization. It's uh, you know this core work was done back in the in the sixties. And uh, it's I, I commend you on doing this work to to dig into this deeper. Um, there are a lot of learnings here. So the um, I think some key takeaways here are um, are certainly um, and 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 Paul hit on this some during the real science lecture. What role can grain processing play here? Um, that can certainly impact things depending on where you're located and and. Um, and, and the cost of these grains. Um, so of course, Paul and Logan, you know, they're in corn husker country. So, <laughs> so, so corn tends to, t tends to be less expensive there than, than when you get to the coast typically. So, so grain processing can play a big role here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as far as energy utilization, um, I think, I think stage of lactation can play a big role here. Uh, and what we're looking at, and um, and and Logan hit on this at the end. I I think there's still a lot to learn here from an amino acid standpoint, and these interactions mm -hmm. between amino acids and and energy. So um, so I'm actually really looking forward to the new NRC being unveiled here very shortly. Yeah. So um, yeah. uh, I'm curious to see what we learn, what learnings we have from that as well. So why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a couple, three yeah. uh, practical uh, things we can do on the dairy farm. Yeah. You know, and as Clay mentioned, um, we are in Cornhusker country, but I had a late friend, uh, many of your viewers may, uh, may know of uh, Dan Kurtz, who is a nutritionist in Ohio. Yeah. And he had this famous saying, I remember I was young in my career, but he had this famous saying corn is free you know and and his, his point was it wasn't necessarily free in ohio uh, and all of these ingredients have their place and trust me he used them all effectively but i that like just coming out of grad school made me think you know we really uh, need to feed the rumen and let the rumen microorganisms do their thing and corn in many parts of the world not all many parts of the world and country is an economical source of energy for for driving the rumen rumen bugs rumen fermentation and energy supply so so corn is free that's that's maybe a takeaway the other thing is you know it's interesting as we start to poke around on some of these amino acids uh, logan had a study showing that you know, when you're feeding low starch and maybe not feeding the rumen bugs, maybe some of these amino acids become short. And he had lysine, and that's kind of speculatory right now to see that. But I think it could show, you know, a rarely could could prove to be an, an exciting area of science looking at some of these amino acids when corn isn't free and you've got to be short. You know, now what do you got to look at to replace some of these amino acids coming from the bugs? 
Uh, great answer. Great place to stop. Gentlemen, this lively discussion has certainly increased my metabolism. And uh, I want to thank you for the great discussion. Uh, you know, it's always exciting to see how new and exciting research can be applied while keeping in mind the changing cow feed char characteristics and the environment. I also want to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by once again here at the exchange to spend some time with us. I hope you heard something new. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you come back here real soon. If you like what you heard, please remember to drop us a five-star rating on your way out. And don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. All you have to do is like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform. Send us a screenshot with your address and your shirt size uh, to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll send a t-shirt right out to you. Our Real Science Exchange lecture series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on each uh, the first Tuesday of each month, visit balchem.com slash real science to see upcoming events and past topics. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. <laughs>